Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody here. I call to worship today. A mighty wind has blown, and tongues of fire have danced. God has poured his spirit upon us, just as Jesus promised. The Holy Spirit, the very presence of Jesus, is with us. He moves among us, gathers us together, empowers us, and calls us to serve the world. Let's praise and worship God with joy. Would you all bow with me for the opening prayer, please? Lord God, as your spirit hovered over creation and fresh wind and new breath, so let your spirit blow over us today with the breath of life. May we dream your dreams and see visions of the world as you created it to be. Fill us with your spirit to live out these dreams and visions as you empower us. Guide our thoughts and actions. Transform us and empower us to be your witnesses so we can show the love and grace of Jesus Christ to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. After waiting many days in prayer, suddenly, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, Jesus' disciples were all together in one house, about 120 of them. Suddenly the house was filled with the sound of a violent wind from heaven. And suddenly, appearing among them and resting on them, were what seemed to be tongues of fire, All the followers of Jesus were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages. Other languages. 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 Crowds of people from every nation came together in bewilderment and amazement and asked, Are not all of these who speak Galilean? How is it that we hear them speaking in our own native language? We hear them declaring the wonder of God in our own languages. What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and spoke to the crowd in the, in the last days. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Er, prophesy. Your youth will be, see visions. Your old men and women will dream dreams. I will show wonders in the heavens above the signs on the earth below. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And on that day, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, guys. Uh, It's taken from Acts 2, 14 and 22 to 41. Then Peter stepped forward with the, 11, of the uh, 11 other apostles, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus, the Nazarene, by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plans, plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him, I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praise. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. Dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet, and we knew God had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of the highest honor in heaven, at God's right hand. 
And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. For David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. So let everyone in Israel know the certain, for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Witnesses for Jesus to the ends of the earth. <coughs> I want you to imagine with me that you are sent on a very special mission. Your mission is to deliver something that is very important. And Jed, I was thinking of you. You drive a truck, and uh, so I'm going to pick on you. So Jean has a very unique device. It's a life-changing device. She uses it all the time. She depends on it, and she just loves it. And Jean has a friend who lives at, on Prince Edward Island, and the friend has been searching for this kind of a, a device for a very long time. And Jean wants her friend to experience it too. So she needs to get her device to her friend along with the special instructions on how to use it. So Jean calls Jed. Will Jed learn from her? Will he learn how to follow the instructions so he can teach her friend exactly how it works? So over the next weeks and months, as Jed does his regular activities, each day Jean teaches him how to use the, uh, the device. He listens, he takes it all in, as Jean shows him and tells him exactly how it works. And Jed practices what she's doing. He does it himself, and he gets excited about the device too. Finally, the day arrives. Jed is ready to go. And Jean blesses Jed as he goes. And Jean promises that she is right there with him. Not physically, but her words are firmly fixed in his mind and in his heart. He has the instruction book, and he has a cell phone close by if he needs to call. And Jean sends Jed on his way. Now as Jed drives that long distance, he meets people along the way. And so he starts to tell them about this life-changing device that he's carrying to, uh, to Prince Edward Island. And as he tells them a little bit more about it, some of them start getting excited about it. And they want to get one of these devices for themselves. And others scoff at him and they say, what? You ta you're taking all this time away from other things that would be so much more fun to drive across the country for, for that? And they walk away. But Jed's convinced of the importance of what he's doing. He's experienced how the device works, and he is a believer. And so he travels to Prince Edward Island and his eye with his eyes fixed on the mission, with joy in his heart, his mum's words in his heart and his mind, and he stays true to the course till he arrives. Last week, we read Jesus' final instructions to his disciples, his ascension to his father. We, we know that Jesus called the disciples, his disciples to follow me about three years earlier. He spent time with them. He taught them the good news of the kingdom of God. He ate with them, he slept with them, he talked and he walked with them. He healed the sick, he set captives free, and he showed them who he was and what he came to do. And then he sent them out 
to do what he did on their own. And they were sent out to heal the sick, to set captives free, and to share the good news of the kingdom of God with the people around them and invite them also to become followers of Jesus. <coughs> and we're told that when they came back there, they were amazed at what God did through them. Eventually, Jesus is arrested, and he dies, and their hopes are dashed. They say, we had hoped he was the one. Apparently, he's not. And then they experience the joy of Easter Sunday. Jesus is alive again. And Jesus tells them that as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. But first, they need the same thing that Jesus needed. They need the infilling of the Holy Spirit, that empowering of the Holy Spirit that will carry them out, carry, uh, will be with them and to be, carry them on the mission. They need that very presence of Jesus with them. So Jesus tells them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Ju Jerusalem and Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit and be witnesses to the ends of the earth. This year as I read those words, those words just really struck me. Witnesses to the ends of the earth. <coughs> if you read the whole Bible, If you read the whole Bible, you'll see that God's desire is for the whole earth to be filled with the glory of God. His desire is for everyone in the whole world to know Jesus and to live in that empowering of the Holy Spirit. It's a common thread that runs through scripture. And part of that common thread is the scattering of people all over the world to witness to the presence and the reconciling power of Jesus Christ. In Genesis 1:28, God blesses Adam and Eve to be fruitful and to increase in number and to fill the earth and subdue it. So we see there that filling the earth was a blessing. It was they were supposed to spread out and fill the earth. <clears throat> and as I was preparing for Pentecost this year, the story of Babel from Genesis chapter 11 kept coming into my mind. It was kind of interesting, then during that time I was at joint council meetings in uh, Ontario and one of the guys there shared a devotional uh, through that time and he shared from that very story. I thought that was quite interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. The whole world had one common language, we're told. And they decided to settle together because they wanted to preserve their unity. They wanted to be together. And so they built a city with a tower that reaches into the heavens to make a name for themselves. And you'll see there, it, t it tells you that they didn't want to scatter. It was almost like they were afraid to be scattered over the earth. But that wasn't God's plan and his desire for cre his creation. And we're told that God confuses their language. And they can't understand each other. He scatters them all over the world. It's, it's almost like God makes them do what he wants them to do. He changes their language, and the change of language causes them to spread out and to fill the earth. It's, and it's not necessarily a punishment, but I, as I looked at that, I thought it's, it's more of a redirection. He's, God's redirecting them or refocusing them on his original intent. They were supposed to be a diverse community, a diverse community, humanity, and they were supposed to fill the earth and, and uh, steward it the way God would. So in Genesis 11, we have the Tower of Babel that is built so that the people can be like God. And then you go into Genesis chapter 12, and it's quite a contrast, because in Genesis 12, it begins with one man, Abraham. And God calls Abraham to leave his country and his home and his people and to go to the place that God will show him, and we're told there that God will build Abraham into a great nation. 
Complete opposite. The people want to make a name for themselves. God tells Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I will make your name great. And we're told that Abraham will have descendants as numerous as stars in the sky. And Abraham and Sarah go in faith, trusting God's guidance rather than their own understanding. And God leads them in the way. And he keeps his promises. And now we skip over to Acts chapter 2. The beginning of Acts chapter 2, we see 120 men and women gathered together in prayer, totally dependent on God, waiting for God and for God's timing to fulfill what Jesus had promised them would come. And again, they're not trying to make a name for themselves, but they're waiting for God to empower them to carry out the mission that Jesus has assigned them to do. And it's also a task that Jesus said will will scatter them, will take them all over the world. And it's a task that will make the name of Jesus great. It's a task that will fill the whole earth with the glory, with the knowledge of the glory of God. And so there they sit and they wait. And suddenly a violent wind sweeps through the building. And what looks like tongues of fire rests on each of them. And it says that all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they all begin to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit enables them. Jerusalem was filled with people of different nationalities at this particular time. They were celebrating the Jewish festival of weeks. And so the temple area would have been very crowded with devoted Jews from, all, from different nations in the known world at that time, as well as proselytes. Proselytes were people from other nationalities who had converted to Judaism. And I read that in that time that usually the visitors knew one of four common languages. They would know Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, or Latin. And the Old Testament was read in Hebrew. The language you would have heard the, te- the Old Testament read at the temple would have been in Hebrew. Doesn't matter if most of the people can understand it or not. That's the language that was used. So all of a sudden, this strong wind blows in. And the people hear this great noise. And then they hear the noise of many people speaking. And they investigate. And what amazes them isn't the wind. What's incredible to them is hearing the disciples speaking the mighty acts of God in their own language. It's unbelievable. Now, some of you in this room may know more than just English. You may know another language. But unless you know that other language really well, you understand in your own language, your first language, best. That's the language that you used. When the 120 start praising God in different languages, they all are hearing, the people are hearing in their own native language not just in Hebrew or Aramaic and Greek and Latin, but they hear the disciples boldly proclaiming God's, proclaiming God and declaring the wonders of what God has done. And it's in their native language, the language that they best understand. And as at this time, I don't know, there was something about that that just flooded me with joy. Just thought, people of every language, every tongue can hear the good news of Jesus Christ. At Pentecost, God spoke to the people in all the languages of the known earth to proclaim the good news of Jesus. They told him about, they told the people about his life, his teachings, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And what's so amazing also about this is that the speakers, the disciples, are Galileans. They're common folk. They're people with accents. They are considered uncultured and uneducated. And yet here they are proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ in languages that they've never known before. And people are clearly hearing and understanding. It's the very reverse of Babel. At Babel, God confused the language. At Pentecost, God didn't unite 
and that have one common language that they, they necessarily all just understood. But God spoke to the people in all of those languages. I just, that's so exciting. God didn't try to make us all one, as in all the same, but he, he calls us as different, different cultures and different colors and different, different uh, characteristics. And he speaks to us in the language that we have. He celebrates diversity and provides way for all languages and tongues to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. It's like at Pentecost, God broke down the barriers of, na of nation and language and class and age, and he unites them as their, their individual nations and languages and tribes, but into one family, one family, the church of Jesus Christ, who will call upon the name, for those who will call upon the name of the Lord. And the body of Christ isn't defined by language and culture and color and skin, but a common faith in Jesus Christ. And that is so amazing. It's so amazing. And that is part of the wonder of Pentecost. But there are also scoffers along the way. And they say that Jesus' followers are drunk. And that's when Peter stands up along with the rest and he addresses the crowd and first, you heard both in the opening, uh, opening scriptures that the boys used and also in the scriptures that, that Logan and I read that he quotes from the Old Testament to explain what's happened. He says, Jesus is God's promised Messiah and it's proven by his miracles and his signs and wonders. He says, God allowed you to put Jesus to death by nailing him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead because it's impossible for, the, for death to keep its hold on him. He says, we are witnesses of this fact. Jesus had been exalted to the right hand of God and sent the Holy Spirit that you have seen and witnessed and heard today. He said, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Therefore, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is one verse I love. He says, this gift and this promise is for you and for all who are far off, that includes us, all who are far off, far off for all whom the, the Lord God will call. And as I was reading that just now, I just thought of Tom and Christine over in Thailand and I think one of the reasons that people of a certain language and nation can can more easily minister to the people of their own language and tongue is because that is what they're used to and so how wonderful it is when people from different nations are able to go we go as well but when you have people like Tom and Christine who are who are working right in the midst of, of the people that they are part of and we're told that the people responded that 3,000 of them believe that day and they commit their lives to Jesus and they are baptized. And they start meeting together with the disciples. And they meet together in joy to learn from the disciples, to pray together, to fellowship together, so as to share with those in need. And other people around see the change that is happening. They see these lives that are changed as these people came to know Jesus. And it says, the Lord added daily to their numbers those who were being saved. And all through the book of Acts, as you read on, you see Jesus' words being fulfilled. The Holy Spirit does scatter them all through Jerusalem and Judea into Samaria and to the ends of the earth so that people may hear the good news of Jesus Christ and all who call upon the Lord can be saved. At the beginning, I asked you to imagine that you were on a very special mi mission. And actually, that's not a, an imagination. You are. Each one of us are on a very special mission. It's our life's work, this special mission. We carry this priceless treasure that people are often longing to hear even if they don't know it. And we are called and we are sent to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We have learned about Jesus. We have believed. We have been filled with the Holy Spirit. 
And the Holy Spirit will use our stories and our words and the scriptures through us and our acts of love to speak to those around us. That they also may come to know Jesus. And even if you think that you stumble with your words and that you can't get it out right, think back to Pentecost. God took these words that were spoken that they may not have even understood what they were saying and used it that 3,000 people came to know Jesus that very day. The Holy Spirit will also give us the words that we need and he will use our words as he did at Pentecost as a living testimony of what it looks like to live the life of the kingdom of God, to live like Jesus. And may that be true for each of us. May we know that we go in the power of the Holy Spirit wherever we are, whatever we are doing. When we go to the grocery store, when we go to pick up the mail, whatever it may be, that God sends us with this priceless treasure. And you never know who you're going to meet, who you're going to have the chance to speak to, and who's going to respond. And sometimes those who respond can be, at, can be the least expected. So continue to pray. Pray for those ones you've been praying for for a long time. I had a wonderful time recently with someone that I've known for quite a while, and the person's opening up a little bit more. And I came away just filled with thanksgiving and praise that God is working in this person's life. And I know that God will continue to work. Trust, believe, know the Holy Spirit is with you as we are sent out on this mission. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, you poured yourself out on the people of the early church. Pour yourself out on us now, I pray. Holy Spirit, you set their tongues on fire so they could speak to one another in ways that could be understood. Set our tongues on fire to speak in different languages and ways so others may hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you said you had to go away so that the Holy Spirit, the Advocate and Comforter, could come. Come once again, Holy Spirit, as the Advocate that we all need and as the, as the Comforter that we all need. Come, Holy Spirit. Fan your flames of love and empower and set us on fire for you once again. May the warm sun of your, sun of your spirit heal us this day. May the gentle rain of your spirit refresh us this day. May the kindled fire of your spirit blaze in us this day. May the fresh winds of your spirit enliven us this day. In the name of God our Father and Jesus Christ his Son, who sends us this special gift of his Holy Spirit. Lord, you know what this next week holds. You know the people that we will run into. You know the experiences that we will have along the way. And I just pray again, O oh God, for those opportunities, especially to share with our words and in our actions the wonder of knowing Jesus. The wonder of being a child of God. Oh, Father, just grant us those opportunities. And we know that it's you, Holy Spirit, that opens hearts and ears to start to hear and start to accept. Lord, may many people in our community come to know Jesus for the first time and may commit their lives to Jesus anew. May they come to know Jesus even more. Lord, I pray that the wind of your spirit may flow through our land, flow through the world again, that many may come to know you. Open hearts, I pray. Open hearts, I pray. Lord, as you have blessed us, may we be a blessing to many, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go out into this week, Jesus welcomes us and walks with us in this new life in the Spirit. Come out, Jesus commands, and calls us from the tombs of our existence into the brightness of a new day. Come out, Jesus cries, and unbinds us from the chains of our past. Come out, Jesus invites us into a world filled with grace and possibility. And then he says, go. Go into a world that needs our life, our breath, our spirit. 
go into a world that needs the Spirit of God carried on our lips and in our loving arms. Go into the world to live as God's resurrected people. Go and go on the breath of God's holy wind. Amen.